I want to thank our guest speaker, a Hilton Distinguished Entrepreneur, CK. Uh, we try to bring the best entrepreneurs for the Hilton Speaker Series, and you're not going to be disappointed. So welcome, CK. How about we give him a warm LMU welcome? Thank you. So many of you guys have uh, seen his background on the poster, but CK, do you mind sharing a little bit about yourself before we get to more meat and sure. uh, detail? Sure. First of all, thank you for having me, uh, David and LMU, and uh, you know, such a wonderful opportunity uh, to meet you. Um, but before I begin, uh, I'd like to actually start with a small story, uh, you know, because most, many of you are uh, in your 20s and students, and uh, this is not my own story, but a story by a, uh, a guy named Guy Kawasaki. Uh, he's a well-known book author, and uh, he's also known as the first Apple um, evangelist. And uh, he was telling a story, I was listening to the podcast, and you know, he was saying uh, when he was 20, uh, people would ask him, hey, what do you want to be? And then he's like, like one day I want to succeed. I want to be successful and I want to drive a Porsche, right? That's what he said. And then 20 years later, uh, he did become successful. He did drive a Porsche. And then like he had a chance to speak uh, in front of college students. And then like, then, you know, he got the same question. It's like, hey, now that you're a successful guy, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? And then, you know, he was thinking, oh, that's a good question. And then um, from the corner of his eyes, he could see like some college students playing basketball. And then that's when it hit him. Oh, you know what? I want to be 20 year old college students. So the moral of the story is the grass is always greener on the other side. And, you know, sometimes you might be like, hey, you know, looks like there's so many people who have, you know, homes and cars and, you know, jobs and how come I don't have, you know, those yet. Uh, the next time you think about that, like, just know that, you know, these people might secretly be, want to be you, <laughs> right? So uh, you're living the best time of your life and you, you, you have infinite amount of possibilities. Um, so just wanted to, you know, start off with that, that quick uh, story. So uh, before you begin, just be happy. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah, be happy. Exactly. Who you are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, about myself, uh, I'm originally from Korea, uh, was born and raised in Korea, came to the U.S. when I was 20 for college. And, um, you know, my upbringing uh, is um, sometimes I joke that, you know, my, my parents, you know, were not typical Asian parents. I mean, they gave, them, gave me a wide choice, wide uh, selection options, uh, as long as it was between neuroscientists and, uh, you know, federal court judge. judge. Um, <laughs> so, but I mean... Another way of saying, um, lawyer or doctor, it was like very <laughs> yeah, academic, you know, like my, my father was a college professor, a uh, university professor, and uh, he would consider something like, you know, under PhD to be like a moderate failure. Um, so we were like living, you know, I was, you know, being raised in that environment, very academic. And um, I wanted to be a doctor without even knowing why. I mean, I, I, I thought that I was going to be, you know, going to medical school and going to be a doctor. Um, I never even met a doctor in my life because I was never sick. Um, but for some reason, I was a pre-med student and I, I was studying biology, chemistry, physics and all of those um, until um, I had a chance to like, I, I had to go back to Korea for military duties because as a Korean man, you have to go to the army. And uh, that's when I started my career in tech uh, because... In Korea, uh, at, back at, at, at that time, if you had a job at a tech company, uh, you could be exempt from the army. So I was like, okay, well, that sounds like a you know, good opportunity. So you know, here's a guy who didn't know anything about tech you know, at all, but then had a job you know, with a tech industry a startup company. Let's go back for a second. So I, I love to uh, explore how our speakers grew up and stuff. So you went through K through 12 in, in Korea. Yep. You got into a good college in Korea. You were, what year in college when you decided you want to come to States? So it was 1994. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, like you were freshman, sophomore? Sophomore. Or? Okay. So you went good college in Korea and often decided, I want to go to the U.S. Why did that happen? Um, my family was going to move to the U.S., except they didn't. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah. ended up like eventually, you know, my, me and my brother uh, who went to Cornell. Uh, so we were the only ones who were study in the US and um, you know eventually we had to go back to Korea mm -hmm. for the you know reason that I just mentioned mm -hmm. okay but but it is even though your family was 
going to move and maybe you're mentally going to move, but it is somewhat unusual, you know, for people in college to, I mean, some people go maybe after college or grad school, but yeah. so why did you choose to do your college education in the U.S.? Again, uh, there was a lot of push from, from my, my parents. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they were really like pushing, uh, uh, as David mentioned uh, back then in Korea, it wasn't very usual path that people would uh, transfer, you know, their college to, uh, U, you know, U.S. Uh, schools. But then my, my, my parents were really pushing for it. And, Why uh, were they pushing? What, what I don't know. I mean, that's, the, that's yeah. not the question for me, right? <laughs> but I, I have no idea. But, you know, my father was pushing really, really hard. Um, and then at some point, I, I think I didn't really like that, right? Obviously, like, you know, I had to start new. And then uh, to be, com you know, perfectly honest with you, it turned out like my, my, my family actually didn't have the financial resources necessarily. So my father was pushing me, hey, you have to go study abroad. But then like he wasn't able to like pay for it necessarily at some point. Sounds like so my I, dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hated it. But um the one good thing, great thing that I learned, um, that I, you know, the skill that I picked up uh, by coming to the U.S. at a relatively early age was um, I learned English, right? And, and uh, that, that skill, uh, you know, became really, really useful when I started working in the professional, you know, uh, field because uh, back then, you know, there were not that many people who were like bicultural, who, who could speak both Korean and English. So it became like a major advantage. Yeah. So later on, I kind of like, you know, gave a kudos and appreciation for that, but yeah. then back then, I didn't really like that decision. Yeah, but your, your dad's kind of a, maybe not detailed calculation, but, you know, vision for you that you'd be a, maybe it'd be better for you for a future in terms of, you know, whatever you want to do, because this is sponsored by the international business. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it ended up actually being to your advantage. Yes, I mean, the yeah. global experience uh, is, I can't really emphasize the global experience more. Uh, not only for school, uh, but be, I it, uh, also worked at Samsung, the, the, the you know, cell phone company, for about four years. And my job was, uh, uh, you know, involved a lot of global uh, business, right? So I had a chance to, like, meet a lot of companies. I almost met Steve Jobs. I mean, that's a, probably a story for a separate time. But, um, you know, just like, you know, being able to meet a lot of great people as part of the job, I, I think there's a lot of appeal to that. So... Yeah, global business, uh, hugely, hugely important. Any way you can get that experience, uh, that would be super, super helpful. Okay, so I want to go back to your, when you went back to Korea, instead of the military, you were able to work for a startup. And before that, you never thought about becoming an entrepreneur. I had no idea. I had no idea. But that turned out to be a crash course because the company uh, that I got hired for was a, um, so there were like 40 people when I joined. And then by the time I left, uh, which was about three and a half years later, uh, it became 300 people company, grew so fast. Uh, most of them were engineers and I was the only non-engineer. And then the company was raising money. The company uh, eventually went IPO. And then I was supposed to be this guy who was severely underpaid. But then because I was doing the military duty, I was supposed to do you know, whatever they were asking of me. And then, um, so I was like, you know, like, how come I'm the only person who is like, you know, writing all this business plan? Like, what is pro forma, you know, <laughs> financials? Like, what, you know, what is all this? Like, what is the executive summary? But that was a crash course uh, for me. So I learned how to write business plan. I learned uh, how to raise money. Eventually, I, I learned how to take the company public. Of course, it wasn't my company, but uh, I had a driver's seat. I was in a driver's seat because I did all the work. Um, so sometimes, you know, it's like, you know, you, you think, hey, why am I supposed to do this? But then you learn so much. If you're putting the 120% in whatever job that you're currently doing, uh, that eventually, you know, benefits you. So, you know, that, because we have lots of 20-year-olds and people in the 20s. So maybe joining a company that's growing very fast is maybe a great stepping stone, a great learning experience. Definitely. For people wanting to become and start their own company. Yeah, I eventually uh, went on to work at Samsung and Google and these big companies. And then, because, uh, you know, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. So after the first company experience, I got hooked by the entrepreneurship and startup. So I knew that, hey, this is something that I'll be doing for the rest of my life. And then because I knew that I was going to start my companies, um, when I was working at big companies, you know, I, I, I worked really hard. Like when I was at Google, I never slept until like, you know, before 3 a.m. pretty much every day. Why? Because I wanted to learn as much as possible. 
it, it wasn't just a job for me. Um, because I knew that I was going to start a company of my own, I wanted to like pick up as much as possible. And um, so I guess the lesson there is, you know, like, you know, we're living in a world where people say, hey, like quiet quitting, quiet quitting, and then just like, you know, doing the bare minimum. Um, I think uh, that's not the best approach uh, because, you know, if you, I want you to think selfishly, right? Like if you want to start your, your own company at some point, there's only so much you can learn uh, when you put in 120%. Like you have to go beyond like certain percentage. Uh, you, like if you like put yourself in there like fully and then just like, hey, you know, give, give 120% of yourself, you can learn so much. And then that's not for necessarily for the, the company that you're working for. Uh, it's really for selfish reasons. Selfish, selfish reasons because uh, especially because uh, you know if you want to start your own company at some point so after that startup experience you joined samsung for a few years and then you went to start your own company yeah so please give a summary of that first startup you worked on which you eventually got sold to google yeah yeah so uh, we got acquired you know um <laughs> I, I guess we were all lucky because um you know but, but by the way this is kind of side story but uh so we, we started a company, uh, and then that got eventually acquired by Google, and this was in 2008. And uh, two weeks later, our uh, acquisition closed. Um, you guys remember like the financial crisis, like Lehman Brothers? I mean, two weeks later, Lehman Brothers uh, went bankrupt. So timing was impeccable. And the second company, which I'll talk about a little later, uh, we got acquired in 2021. And 2022, another financial crisis, right? So timing-wise, we got super lucky in terms of acquisition. So the lesson there is uh, there's a lot of factors you can't control. You know, there's a lot of luck factors, but you got to be there, right? You can't just like, hey, say, like, you know, I'm not doing my part, but then like for some reason, you know, luck is going to happen and then all of a sudden, like everything will solve. Uh, that doesn't really happen. But in the meantime, not everything, all the, you know, good outcomes are because of what you did. I mean, there's a lot of luck factors involved. Yeah. Um, but going back to the first company, so this was when Web 2.0 was uh, a, a thing. Um, this was back in 2006, 2007. Uh, now it's all about Web 3, but back in the day, it was Web 2. And then um, uh, I, I partnered with uh, this other entrepreneur. His name is Chester, and then we partnered uh, together. And then uh, we started this blogging software company, and then we got acquired by Google because uh, Google was looking for, um, you know, Korea, so we started this company in Korea, and Korea is one of like three markets where Google is not the dominant player for search market. Uh, we had a very strong uh, local competitor, a local service called Naver, and 80%, 90% of people were using Naver search instead of Google search. Um, and the way they could dominate the market was because they had um, in-house content. So they had blogging software tools, uh, so on and so forth. So they were like producing a lot of content and then uh, indexing those content back to their own search engine. So Google wanted to acquire a blogging company because we were producing a lot of content. Uh, so that was the first company that we got acquired. Okay, so blogging company that was producing a lot of, how did you grow that company? How did that company get noticed? How did you get traction there? Mm -hmm. So we built something like WordPress for Korea. We had an open source arm and then we had a commercial service and then um, I guess timing wise, it was really good because people were looking for content creation tools and blogging tends to be, you know, happens to be one of the first uh, content creation tools that people use. Mm -hmm. So we were there early um, and we built a really good products and uh, our team was really good. I mean, my other partner uh, came from uh, one of the top engineering schools in Korea called KAIST. And uh, he recruited a lot of great engineers from that school. Mm -hmm. So kind of similar to how Spotify, you know, Spotify, Sweden, um, they had a good access to engineers from the university program. Mm -hmm. So we got a, a lot of help from the university connection. Mm -hmm. So you had good technology, you had good traction with the yeah. blog, okay. And then you were one of the leaders or? I was a co-founder, co-CEO. No, what I'm saying, the, the, the blogging. Yeah, so was yeah. One of the leaders. Yeah, we were number one. Yeah. Number one, number yeah. one, okay. Yeah. So that's why Google then, yeah. okay. And then the funny story, if I can go like, you know, a couple minutes is, um, so I actually broke the acquisition news on my personal blog and I was like, Hey, who's going to read my personal blog. Right. And then at that time on my personal blog, 
um, I was using a fake um, profile picture uh, of a you know Korean actress, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I was just like you know, blogging under a uh, pseudonym, right? And then I you know I broke the news of acquisition uh, there, and then uh, a publication called Read Write Web actually picked that up, so they actually ran a news on that. It's like, hey, Google acquired the first Korean company, blah, blah, blah. And then um, they had a syndication deal with New York Times. Oh my so God. my yeah. blog article got picked up by Read Write Web, which got then picked up by New York Times. So I was on the front page for, for like a brief minute you know, of New York Times. And then people reach out to me you know, through the blog you know, uh, messaging system. And then you know, it was really surprising because a lot of people were actually commenting on my appearance. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm like, oh, is this the experience that female entre entrepreneurs go through? Because uh, oh, it's like, okay. you know, people didn't, I mean, I wouldn't get any comment about my appearance if I was using my real photo, right? So, you know, that was some side story, but yeah, that yeah. was kind of funny. Well, well, on that, you know, in Korea, I'm sure not that many companies get acquired by Google, right? So we're like a... To date, to date uh, we're, we were the only company that was acquired by Google. Okay, so that probably was a big story yeah, were you like a superstar among your friends? You I mean, buy a lot of drinks to, to your buddies. Drinks, yes, <laughs> uh, because we're Koreans. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it was good. Uh, I think we had a good PR uh, yeah. run out of it. Uh, a lot of people congratulated us, and then you're right. I mean, back then the M and A acquisition market wasn't really active in Korea, right. so we were one of very few companies that got, that got acquired. I was asking this question because we have some common friends. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was wondering, you know, maybe he was a rock star among those guys as a result. But so as a part of this acquisition, and I think there was an HR issue, but you end up coming to the US. Yeah. Yeah. So the first couple of years I was working at the Google uh, Seoul office, but then I transferred to Mountain View, the headquarter. I was running a product called blogger.com, which still exists. Still exists yeah. uh, very, very big, massive, but then it's a very old tool. Uh, but I was a product manager for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then let's talk about your latest uh, successful venture, Tapas. Yeah, so I was at Google for about four years, and then obviously, you know, when you're at a company for four years as, as an entrepreneur, you know, the, the bug, right, uh, starts developing. So I was, hey, like, what, what should I do next, right? And um, I was thinking about a lot of different ideas. Um, one thing I always wanted to do was um, I wanted to actually look at the Asian market, Korean market, because I'm you know very familiar with the market, um, and then try to like see what's interesting there and proven kind of business model. You know, Korea tends to be uh, kind of early adopters in uh, some business models. Um, you know, like esports, uh, we had very early version of esports back in like early 2000s. Uh, so on and so forth. So uh, I wanted to kind of look at the Korean market and try to like find you know something very interesting and try to globalize that. And the other angle is obviously because uh, I was building content publishing platform, I wanted to kind of see uh, what content publishing interesting content publishing platform models uh, were out there. And then this was around 2012, 2013. Uh, if you guys remember, like iPhone came around and uh, mobile publishing was becoming a thing. Um, and then uh, we looked at the Korean market and uh, immediately what I found was um, this you know, thing called Webtoons. Uh, that was like a very phenomenal, you know, very popular. Uh, so basically it's like a serialized digital comics, but uh, read by not just comics fans, but then pretty much by everybody, right? Why? Because uh, they built a platform. They built something like YouTube uh, for visual storytelling. And uh, we thought that, hey, when it comes to mobile, mobile should be visual because back then, like Pinterest, Instagram, you know, these things were popping up. And then, hey, what is the visual storytelling for mobile? And then maybe like this Webtoon thing can be really interesting. The other really interesting thing uh, about the Webtoon market was, um, it was it wasn't just about like stories that you read on the phone. It was a publishing platform. So um, a very good way to generate IP, very cost-effective way to generate IP that would become like TV dramas and you know, shows and everything. So you know, we thought that was really interesting. And then we looked at the US market. We didn't really find anything quite like it. So we started uh, the company back in 2013. This, this was when you were at Google still or when you, you left? And, okay. 
Yeah, the the tail end of my Google career, like towards like you know the last six months, um, I was like you know actively searching for my next business. So um, I was pretty much ready to build this platform by the time I was leaving Google. Okay, so. Could you maybe share how you went about building this platform? Did you have an MVP? Did you get feedback? How did you know when you actually knew you were going to have traction? Yeah, so initially we were like trying to build a, a publishing platform for creators, right? Uh, you guys are familiar with the two-sided marketplace model, right? Like Uber, Airbnb, the second marketplace where there's a supplier and consumers, right? And then when it comes to um, uh, the marketplace model, typically you have to start from the supplier side. I mean, eventually you have to have both, mm -hmm. but you have to have the supplier side first. Uh, imagine Uber without driver. I mean, that, the whole thing doesn't work, right? So the first thing we went out to do was, okay, so we, we're gonna build this platform. Can we get the creators you know, that can publish on our platform? Um, and then we literally met with, you know, physically met with a lot of creators uh, in the US, in, in California, and then um, I think we met something like, you know, 100 to 200 people and six people signed up. <laughs> so that means what, yeah. like what, like nine, no, 94 no. people said no, yeah. right? Um, I mean, sometimes in a very colorful way. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we heard a lot of no's. Um, but then we started with six people. Uh, that number eventually grew to like 20,000 within two years-ish. And then eventually, uh, I think these days we have something like 100,000 creators publishing on the platform. Okay, so. wait. So when, when you approach 100 people, 94 people say no, you don't think maybe this is the wrong business? Well, you gotta, if there's anybody who wants to start their own business, you gotta be familiar you know, with uh, hearing those. I mean, the same for fundraising, right? Uh, like fundraising, you know, it's all about finding one investor. It's not about like how many no's you're getting you're hearing, it's really all about like finding one person, uh, one investor, you know, that can um, invest in your idea, right? So that's like a mindset. Uh, of course, you know, that's not a natural mindset. So we have to learn. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I guess like that's one of the skills you, you learn as you go as an entrepreneur, like your character really builds, you know? But I understand that about fundraising, but you know, when you approach artists and they say, no, you think maybe, maybe there is no need for this or something. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't have doubts of the, of the idea. Yeah, so um, a lot of people were concerned about the ownership of IP. Uh, and what we did was we, we were trying to learn as much as possible. Okay, so you can say no, but then can you at least tell us why, mm -hmm. right? How can we improve? Mm -hmm. uh, and then we captured uh, what is missing from the market, mm -hmm. what is the market needs, and then what, what do the creators exactly need, right? So that was a really good learning opportunity uh, for us. Um, so yeah, we were able to like capture it down to like three points, mm -hmm. uh, which is people really wanted like a very robust publishing platform. Mm -hmm. uh, and then social aspect, you know, that's a huge element. And then third uh, was uh, monetization. So mm -hmm. people were saying all these different things, but then it, it really came down to those three uh, areas. Mm -hmm. So as the company is growing and you're working on this company for many years, any um any critical uh, moments where you thought, oh my God, this is not gonna work, or you, when, you, when you're upset or depressed, any, any, any moments like that? Many, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, what are like, some you can where, where do I start? Yeah. I, I mean, for, to... for us, uh, fundraising was really difficult because uh, the model was already proven in one market, you know, Korean market, but then uh, we didn't have any comparable, like Webtoons came around in 2014, but then they were like almost a private company, so they didn't have to like go out there, and raise money. So we didn't really have a comparables, right? Um, so like when we were trying to explain the model and its potential, people didn't understand at all, uh, pretty much. So fundraising was really, really difficult. Um, and uh, you know, my wife sometimes would say, hey, like there's three things that she hates the, the most. It's like death, tax, and fundraising. <laughs> because when yeah. we were company was <laughs> raising funding, I become like super nervous, and then I'm like, you no, know, not talking. So she could see that, right? So uh, for us, like fundraising was really, really difficult. Uh, but yeah, I mean, somehow we were able to raise money and then kept going. So yeah, got super lucky there. I didn't know you're stressed because you seem so calm all the time. Yeah. Um, internally, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so you, you get stressed sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, okay. And then, and then, how did you? Um, what was the process like about 
selling the company? So yeah, we never try to sell the company. I mean, you know, one lesson for everybody here is, um, you know, there's a phrase, I mean, you, you guys all know this, but the companies are never sold, they're only acquired. So um, you're trying to sell your company, the moment you're trying to sell your company, uh, people kind of know that, uh, can sense that. So uh, you, can't, you can't really approach, you know, that way. Um, so for us, uh, what happened was, um, we had a pretty good success over 2019, 2020, the metrics were really, really good. Uh, we were, you know, seeing tremendous growth. And uh, 2021, uh, we went out to raise money. Uh, this was our Series C funding. Uh, and then we got the term sheet relatively quickly. Uh, we got the term sheet from, you know, uh, within like three days or something. Yeah. And then we went, went back to the existing shareholders, uh, including Kakao Entertainment. So they were already our existing shareholders. And when you raise money, when your company raises money, you have to get the approval from the existing shareholders, right? So we talked to them, hey, like we're raising money here, and then can we get your approval for this, consent for this? And then they were like, hey, why do you raise money from outside? We can you know, fund your company. Uh, but then we didn't really, really like the idea because the ownership was gonna be too high for us. So uh, we weren't like super comfortable about that idea. So uh, a lot of back and forth, uh, and then that eventually became a acquisition discussion, and then that's like a long story over like you know three months period, and um, you know like I, I was ha always on the phone, you know, call with our, our board members. Uh, the most like critical moment I still remember, like you know, this was a very very critical calls with our board and um, you know uh, everybody, and you know, this was during the spring break, so I had to you know take kids to somewhere, and then like we went to uh, Death Valley. And then I didn't know that there was no cell phone signal around like 30 mile <laughs> radius. So my hands were literally shaking because I, I was supposed to be on a call with board member. I mean, this is an important kind of, you know, acquisition deals, right? But then, you know, I was like, you know, uh, offline. But anyway, um, yeah, so there was a lot of back and forth. Uh, eventually the deal closed. Uh, in hindsight, uh, what really spurred our deal was a similar deal uh, closing. So. Um, I mean, this is all public now, but uh, Naver, uh, competitor to Kakao uh, in Korea, uh, bought a company called Wattpad. And uh, that was like a big moment because, you know, the whole like mobile publishing market was kind of heating up, right? And um, because our competitor actually closed the deal, that helped our company to get acquired. So, yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, if you think about competitors, you, you kind of hate them, but then sometimes you're pulling for them because when something good happens to them, I mean, it's eventually good for you. So it's like a love-hate, you know, relationship. But anyway, yeah, uh, the whole thing took about three months uh, and we, we closed in May 2021. Three months is relatively quick. Yeah. 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 So, um, so now officially you've uh, resigned from the CEO position? Of, um, yeah, it's been about uh, a year and eight months uh, since the closing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I, I left the company um, and I officially started my sabbatical. Uh, this is the, the first time I'm taking any mean, meaningful amount of time off the work, uh, off work, you know, throughout my entire career. So uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, so, yeah. So now that you're on sabbatical and as you reflect back on your career, and I also know you invested in like 40 different startups. Um, when you look at what made me, maybe made you successful or make some of your investment successful, what do you, what do you think uh, might be some qualities that are important? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up because uh, honestly, I learned so much from angel investing myself. Um, so I was always raising money for, for my companies, but then I started angel investment about three years ago, uh, and I ended up investing in about 45 companies so far, including nine uh, funds. I'm participating as an LP. Um, I learned so much from the investment. Uh, I mean, sometimes I see like the same mistakes that I have made, uh, that I made uh, from the entrepreneur that I'm talking to. One trait uh, that I can point to, I mean, you know, it's, it's like, you know, there's so many different factors and you can't really pinpoint, right? Um, but I would say it's like an obsession in something. I mean, you can like feel that, right? Like when you, when you meet an entrepreneur who is obsessed about something, right? You know, about a problem, 
uh, about a change, right? Uh, I'm sure you, you all have like friends around you who are obsessed about something, right? Uh, and then when it comes to that particular topic, you know, that person goes super enthusiastic. It's like, you know, they know everything about that field. Um, so it's really, really finding the mission and, you know, super obsessed about that one particular area. Uh, I think that's really, really powerful and palpable. Yeah. Uh, the first company I co-founded was a Korean company, right? We started in Korea for Korean customers. And the second company uh, was in Silicon Valley. So we started in Silicon Valley and we moved to uh, LA. So um, in a way, that was my first company uh, in a sense because we started in, uh, in the US. Um, and then the other thing, uh, honestly, was a little bit of struggle at the beginning was a different culture because I, I always came from the engineering sort of product background. I mean, that was my first company. Uh, Google was taking that notion to extreme. I mean, Google is just, you know, they're not shy about engineers being the first class citizens and then everyone else being the second class citizens. <laughs> so very engineering driven culture. Uh, so I learned so much from Google, you know, years. Mm -hmm. And then um, I was trying to build similar company uh, when I started the second company. So initially it was a very engineering heavy, product heavy company, but then it didn't take too much too long until it became a content driven company because yeah. we were building an IP platform and then you know, we were becoming a content company. And that was a culture shock for me as a founder. I mean, you would think that founders don't have you know, experienced a culture shock, but I had a lot of culture shock because hiring was different, right? Like we, could hire, we had to hire a lot of the content uh, you know, uh, industry people and then such a gap. I mean, it's like, you know, they're brilliant in their own field, but then like in terms of tech, mm -hmm. tech savviness, you know, like we had to train them, educate them, so a lot of culture uh, kind of, you know, challenges. Um, so then, you know, what I did was I thought a lot about like how to build a company. I mean, at some point my product changed from the actual app and services to the company. So uh, when you build a company and then the company grows, uh, at some point your company becomes your product as a CEO. So then you start thinking about, okay, so how do you make sure your people are, you know, on the same page all the time. Uh, how do you make sure they're as motivated as you, right? So building the organization, motivating the team members, you know, all of those. I think that 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 point comes when uh, when your company becomes around. Like for me personally, it was around like 80 people, like 70, 80, 90. That like until then, you know, you as a CEO, you have to do everything. Like you have to look at the product, you have to like do everything tech. You should be involved uh, in pretty much everything. But um, I think like 70, 80 people, when the company grows that level, um, the, the product changes for you as a CEO. So yeah, uh, I would say like second company was very different, uh, but I'm sure you know, there were a lot of learnings that I could learn, uh, could take from the first company and applied as well. Yeah. Is, it, is that why you moved to LA? Because it's more content company? Yeah, we had an office here. Uh, we had an office in New York, San Francisco here, and Korea, China. But uh, I was coming here like once a month. And uh, when the pandemic hit, you know, we were like, hey, because the company was becoming more and more a uh, content company, mm -hmm. and uh, we started working from home, so we could uh, work from anywhere. Mm -hmm. So we came down uh, in 2020. Mm -hmm. okay. It's like a feeling when you meet, but it's really interesting because you meet a lot of people, right? And, and then these people have all different personality types. And uh, sometimes they're like super, sh kind, of, you know, kind of on the shy side. Sometimes they're very outspoken. That doesn't matter. Uh, when you see somebody, I mean, there are people who are like, hey, I got to back this person right now. Otherwise, I'm not going to have a chance. Uh, there are people like that. What makes people like those people? I don't know. I mean, it might be like a combination of different things, but I think the closest thing that I found personally was, again, obsession and the mission driven. It's like, you know, why am I on this earth? I'm gonna try to solve this, right? I'm gonna take this and then, hey, this is an area that I care about like, super, like you know, uh, a, a lot. And then I'm not gonna stop until I find a solution for this. Uh, uh, there are people like them. And then when you meet those people, it's so refreshing. It's like, oh my gosh, I mean, this person is trying to change the world, 
literally, right? Um, I mean, for me personally, it's really about you know backing startups, uh, entrepreneurs that I, a lot of times, you know, it's like people that I already know, and it's like I'm rooting for them, and you know, the business. Uh, I don't know about the, their business as much as they do, but uh, I like to back them because I want I want to see them you know succeed, uh, so on and so forth. The fact that you had hard time fundraising sometimes. Does it make you more compassionate to, towards the entrepreneurs raising, or does it not make a difference? Uh, maybe compassion may not be the best term, but like you know, I'm trying to share my my mistakes. It's like, hey, you know, you're not supposed to do X, Y, Z, because I mean, that's the same mistake that I made, right? Mm -hmm. I think that makes a difference, right? Like when you when you say, hey, yo, I don't I don't know about that, without necessarily having any context behind that, uh, that versus like, hey, I've been there, right, and I made the same mistake, and uh, for me, at least, like it didn't work out. So therefore, you have to think, you know, X, Y, Z. I think that that does make a difference. Okay. Struggles, many. You know, self doubt, many, many. Um, so like, when you pitch your company to investors, right? Investors have to say no most of times, right? Because they are not in the charity, and just because they said no doesn't mean that they hate you. Uh, it, you know, like a lot of times, the thesis doesn't work, doesn't meet, right? It's like, you know, they're investing in B2B SaaS companies and then you're pitching your consumer startup ideas, right? They will have to say no. Uh, that doesn't mean that your idea is bad, right? But for me, uh, it took a while until finding that, you know, that, that, that truth because, you know, um, I'm relatively, like some, I'm somebody who doesn't really care about what other people think about me, relatively speaking, um, which I think is a very important trait for entrepreneurs. You shouldn't care about what other people think. Uh, too much. Like, if you care a lot about what other people think about you, like you compare yourself to other entrepreneurs, oh, like this company raised like big funding and like we're, we have better technology, how come we didn't raise money? Uh, you don't want to get into that trap, trap, right? But even for somebody like me, uh, just imagine, you know, you go to this investor meeting, uh, you know, three times in a row. That was actually one of the mistakes that I made. Uh, if I go back, I would never like, schedule investor meetings back to back to back. Uh, sometimes you do that because you want to crunch all these meetings together, right? Mm -hmm. but, but then, you know, just imagine going to all these like three different meetings and then hearing no every single time. By the third time, you know, you're like, hey, am I, am I the stupid one, right? It's like, you know what I'm saying? Um, but uh, it's not really about your company. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's a mismatch. So your, your goal is to find uh, one company, uh, I mean, I, I think the same applies to pretty much everything, like finding your spouse, you know, finding your employees, uh, you know, I think the same principle applies to all of those. Uh, it's not about like satisfying, trying to satisfy everybody in the room. It's really about finding that one person that, you know, work, uh, that can work with you, right? Uh, Self-doubt, again, you know, like you will have a lot of moments like that, um, but at the end of the day, the conviction, you know, to that idea, right? I, I, I think it goes back to the same thing. Uh, the mission driven, the obsession, like what is the one thing that you're trying to do? Even if you don't make any money from this, right? You can, you know, walk away from nothing. Would you be comfortable working on this one problem still? Would you be happy with this, right? If you have that one thing, you can sustain. But if you don't have that, then, you know, like entrepreneurship is full of problems. You know, full of you know all kinds of you know problems, and then I've seen many many smart entrepreneurs uh, who you know stumbled because of you know lack of foundation. It's like they're smart people and they want to do a startup, right? Because everyone around them is like you know startup entrepreneurs, and it looks sexy, it looks really like promising. Oh yeah, like you know I can start a company and then sell it a hundred million dollars, and you know I'll be you know rich and all of that. So there's a lot of attraction to that idea. But once you start that, there's so many problems. So if you don't have that foundation, chances are you will be like, oh, like what am I doing here? So finding that one mission, obsession, uh, I think the same thing goes back to, uh, it goes back to the same, same question. He also asked, what's the greatest thing about being an entrepreneur? What's the best? What's the best? Yeah, um, best it's thing. like a, you know, high risk, high return. I mean, when things work out, you know, you can make a lot of money. Um, and not just about money, but uh, social impact, right? You get to say that, hey, I'm the one who built that, right? I mean, that's pretty cool, right? 
Um, so you get that benefit, but, but again, you guys all know, you know, external validation versus your satisfaction, right? Um, if you are somebody who, again, you know, going back to the same, like I, I keep repeating the same thing, but if you, if you have that one thing that you want to solve, right? Then just the idea that you have spent significant amount of your, your life trying to solve that problem, that alone, you know, gives you the satisfaction. Um, one of my friends did a startup for seven years, and then unfortunately it didn't go anywhere. So they had to fold, you know, they had to fold the startup. So, you know, I was talking to him recently, and then, uh, hey, like, what, what do you, how do you feel about that? Do you have regrets? And then he said, no, absolutely no regret. Like for seven years, uh, he knew that that was uh, what he wanted to do. Uh, that's still his mission. He, if he does another startup, it'll be a similar field. And then he gave 100% every single day, every single day, every single night. So just knowing that he has zero regret. So I've, you know, that was really refreshing. Um, so I think that internal satisfaction uh, is the biggest reward that you can get. Would you recommend your kids to go into an entrepreneurial career or? <laughs> <laughs> your daughter says no, yeah. but. Uh... We'll, we'll see about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, you, you want to support, we talked about, you want to support a lot of entrepreneurs yes, today. Yes, yes. I mean, well, what's the reason behind that? I mean, pay it forward. Uh, right. I think, it, you know, that's definitely uh, one of the human traits. Like, you know, not just me, but everybody that, that I talk to, a lot of people that I talk to uh, say, you know, they want to pay it forward. Um, so I think that's part of the human nature. Mm -hmm. So definitely want to, you know, help other entrepreneurs pay it forward. I mean, for my angel investment, I'm not necessarily doing that for money, but if there's a return, I mean, that's even nicer, yeah. right? So, yeah. Okay. Started, so the company was started in 2012. The service uh, we launched in 2013. So 2012, 2013, that time frame, uh, in hindsight, was too early. You know, we were too early in the market. And uh, you know, after selling the company, uh, at one point, you know, I was thinking like, okay, so let me like, you know, go back to the journey and then kind of review, right? And then I was like, you know, going through my journey and then like year by year, what did I do, so on and so forth, right? And then. Um, you know, I could see like the company was in three different phases. The first phase, uh, we were like, you know, growing really fast uh, because our KPI uh, key metric was uh, creator numbers, right? And then we were able to raise money relatively easily because I'm a second you know, time founder, ex-Google and all of that. So relatively easy going. Um, the middle, you know, is usually the middle period is the hardest one, like the messy middle, right? So, you know, we were going through like all these difficult uh, times. And then the second, the third phase, uh, we were going like, you know, like this. Uh, we had a lot of nice growth, a uh, very good time. And, uh, you know, we were able to raise money and, uh, you know, could eventually sell the company. The middle period was the hardest one, right? And then I was like, you know, measuring, okay, so like when, you know, how long was this, right? And then um, we, I think it was around two and a half years. And then separately, independently, we were like trying to see, okay, so our time to market, like how early was that, right? And then guess what? Uh, came out to be about two and a half years. So we were about two and a half years too early in the market. Um, so that's the time to market. You guys learn about the time to market, right? And, you know, then the question is, okay, so can you just like nail like perfectly, you know, time to market, right? Like, you know, too early, you're too early, right? You don't want to be too late. There's no humanly possible way that you can go into the market at a perfect time. It, it, like, you know, people, they talk about like, you know, different ideas, but then my conclusion is like, there's no way that you can, you know, time it perfectly. Uh, that's why, you know, putting the team, a uh, really good team is really uh, important because when you have a good team, uh, you can be slightly late to the market, but then you're gonna catch up to the competition. Uh, and if you have a right team, then uh, if you are too early, then you're gonna navigate your way. You might either, either pivot or you might sustain that time period, uh, so on and so forth. So yeah, time to market, very important, but very hard to uh, predict. Yeah, Bill, Bill Gross of Idea Lab, uh, very famous entrepreneur in LA, looked at all his portfolio of companies that he backed and thought timing was the biggest uh, differentiator between all the success yeah. and failure, but very hard to, hard to figure it out. We're running out of time, but um, <clears throat> since we've got some young folks here, any last minute uh, 
advice you might want to offer to you know maybe aspiring entrepreneurs things take long you know things take longer than you might expect uh, so don't be impatient uh, don't try to like you know because I mean you're, when you're young you're super aspirational right so you you want to like there's so many things you want to achieve that's great but never lose your focus because don't don't try to like you know accomplish like seven eight different things at the same time I mean that's an easy uh, trap to fall when you're young because again you know you have uh, ambitions right but uh, what 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 is typically the case is and of course like you know in, in some cases you might see like news about oh this company got you know started and then like within two years they became unicorn company you know you see those news articles all the time right but that's pretty much like you know when you look at ESPN oh like LeBron James right I mean how many LeBron Jam Jameses can be there right so typically uh, things take much much longer than you expect or, or hope so just knowing that uh, be more patient and uh, try to maintain the focus knowing that hey like this one thing that I'm trying to solve uh, it's gonna be like a five-year journey it's gonna be a 10-year journey so if you know that um, you're not gonna be as anxious so um, yeah it's just you know things typically take long time and then don't be impatient uh, maintain that focus maintain that focus uh, is what I can say well I want to thank you for coming in sharing your expertise and your yeah. experience thank you um, and uh, you know and spilling your gut so thank you again how about a big hand for uh, CK? Thank you.